I'm here with Beverly Walloff, lace historian and photographer, and she will be speaking to us about the work that she did investigating the Mount Vernon Lace Collection. We know that there are two main production centers of lace in Europe, and that's France and that's Flanders. Could you talk a little bit about those areas and also who made lace in those areas? Um, in the 18th century, there's no question that France and Flanders were the lace-making capitals. There were other countries that were doing it, Germany, Spain, Italy still, but um, their designs were not what was uh, desirable, excuse me, that the designs were not as desirable, their thread was not as fine, and so France and Flanders really took the lead on lace production. They brought different things to the table. In order to understand French lace production, you actually have to go back into the 17th century with Louis XIV, who built and rebuilt Versailles with all of its luxury and all of its opulence, and he decided that he wanted his court to dress in a way that was reflective of the wealth of the French uh, uh, royalty. So one of the things he required is that his court wore lace. The catch was, the court was very happy to wear lace. The catch was that French lace in the 17th century was really not up to par with what they could get from Italy. So the French uh, royalty was pouring its money into Italy buying Italian lace. And Louis XIV decided no. So his financial advisor Colbert imported Italian lace makers into France to teach the French lace makers how to make better lace. Now, there's lots of stories about how those Italian lace makers wound up in France. Some say they were invited, some say they were hired, some say they were kidnapped. One way or another, Italian lace makers wound up in France and they were situated in towns that already had something of a lace making history such as Alençon and Argentan. And the Italian lace makers taught the French lace makers how to make a better French lace. Now, to give the French credit, um, that was not all of what they did. They have always been very excellent about providing education. So it's not someone sits down and just makes a piece of lace. You need artists to make the designs and make the patterns. You need people who are going to make the, to grow the thread in the case of linen and flax. You need spinners who can make very fine thread. And you also need people, especially when it gets into bobbin lace, um, showing how, what the path of the threads are going to be. It's all very complicated. And then you have the lace makers. Um, all of that took place, and um, the, the French lace went from a very middling kind of lace into something that was quite beautiful. The French designers tended toward classical lines. They liked columns. They liked vases with flowers coming out of it. Their designs tend to have a center axis. It was very formal. It was very luxurious, and it was very much part of the French court. French lace. We're going to leave that for a second. At the same time this was going on, Flanders already had a reputation for making very fine bobbin lace. Uh, they actually started their path back in the 16th century, and by the middle of the 17th century, they were known for their bobbin lace. At around 1740, in fact, in fact, um, uh, Colbert also imported some Flemish lace makers to teach the French lace makers how to make bobbin lace, not just needle lace. So that was also part of the story. What the F Flemish lace makers brought in more than the French did was the thread. It was extraordinarily fine. Think of baby hair, working with baby hair in order to make a design that was so tiny, so intricate, that you're working with these threads that um, it could take as many as 800 bobbins to make a width of lace that was only four inches wide. And I'll give you some idea of how fine the thread was. At around 1740, um, the Flemish lace makers, Flemish lace towns, such as 
Mechlin, Valenciennes, Brussels. There was a little bit of a division. In the initially, there was not much difference between the flat, the the bobbin lace that was made in one town versus another. At around 1740, there got to be a division. The Valenciennes and the uh, the town of Val Valenciennes and Brussels kept with what they were already doing. But the town of Mechlin introduced something that's called a silky gimp. A gimp thread in bobbin lace is an outline around the motif. And they introduced this silky gimp thread that would outline the motif. And what it did was, was it gave the motif a little bit of a pop um, visually so that it made something a little more exciting. They also, um, they also did a lot of work in flowing the designs more, whereas the French had much more of a static design. In Mechelen, they really developed the pattern so that it was a lot of leaves and it was flowing. And it went from side to side of the lace rather than looking like it was traversing down the full length. And all of that gave it a grace and a, a beauty that was soft and very alluring. One of the reasons I'm emphasizing Mechelen lace is because there was a lot of Mechelen lace in Martha Washington's collection. It was obviously her favorite, and it was good reason for it. So Beverly, we know that there are two main lace types, bobbin lace and needle lace. Could you briefly describe those two different types? Today, there are many different ways of making lace. You can knit lace, you can crochet lace, you can applique lace, of course there's machine-made lace. But in the 18th century, there were only two techniques. One was needle lace and the other was bobbin lace. And the names to the type of laces goes with the tools that were used to make the lace. Needle lace, which most people assume came out of Italy, was based on embroidery. And it started with uh, really exquisite embroidery, particularly for the church. And it was a lot of white on white embroidery. Uh, there were two embroidery techniques that um, created, created holes in the fabric, if you will. One is cut work, where you cut out a hole in the fabric and you keep it from unraveling by doing buttonhole stitch all the way around the hole. And if you do a hole and a hole and a hole and a hole, all of a sudden you have a flower. So cut work was one technique. Another technique, embroidery technique, was something called drawn work, where, for example, let's say you had a square, you had a woven fabric, and you cut out the threads going in one direction in the square, and so it created sort of a mini loom within the fabric. And then you created your design by wrapping threads in certain directions, or you could even cut the whole hole out and create a mini loom within that space, and again using the buttonhole stitch to create a design within a space. Needle lace is entirely based on the buttonhole stitch. Um, even when it's done more loosely, as it's done now, in a variety of different configurations, it always comes back to the buttonhole stitch. Needle lace, because it always has an understructure, a thread on which it is based on or around, has a certain um, body to it. It's like having a spine um, or an armature underneath the lace making itself. And so there have been times when it was more popular because the, um, uh, the textiles, the fabric, whatever, um, required a balance of lace that had a little more um, presence to it. By contrast, bobbin lace is a much softer looking lace. The way it is made is that you have a pillow, <clears throat> which is usually stuffed with straw or something very stiff. <clears throat> Your pattern is on top of it. You have a row of pins going across the top and you have these long threads that are draped over the pins. And at the bottom are bobbins that have more thread that you can unwind as you go. And <clears throat> there, are, in, in contrast to needle lace, which everything's based on the buttonhole stitch, in bobbin lace, there are only two stitches. One is a crossover and the other is a twist. 
And the way, as you're progressing through the piece, following the pattern, you keep your threads in place by using pins, which is why sometimes bobbin lace is called pillow lace, because the pillow and the pins are so essential in making the lace. Um, and that's basically the two differences. What, whether one was more popular than the other at any given time had to do with the textiles that it was balancing. So, for example, there were times when the textile was a very heavy textile, it was uh, very ornate, and so sometimes you wanted a softer bobbin lace to counteract that. Sometimes you wanted a more ornate bobbin, uh, needle lace because you were trying to balance heavy with heavy so that the lace would still show up. There were other times, especially in the 18th century, as the century progressed, fabric design, textile design, became airier and lighter. And you didn't want a heavy needle lace with that. You wanted something that was soft and uh, created that same airy feeling that went along with the textile design. And so for much of the 18th century, bobbin lace was more popular because it communicated that soft, gentle look that people were trying to get. Mount Vernon has about 40 to 50 pieces of lace attributed to Martha Washington. Could you talk a little bit about the Mount Vernon collection? There are a, a couple of pieces of French needle lace. There is a piece from Alençon. There is a piece from Argentan. There is a piece from Lille. But by far, most of the lace is Flemish. And uh, there's a little bit of Valenciennes. Uh, there's a little bit of Brussels. But more than anything, there is Mechelen lace. What was interesting to me as I was going through it was that it's an interesting timeline of how lace was evolving in the 18th century. The oldest pieces date from the 1740 to 1750 period. And those pieces, um, there's 80% motif to 20% background. And that was typical of the time. As the lace was, as I dated lace later into the century, you see more background, more ground, um, a little less motif, and that was typical of the time. Having said that, all of it is very elegant. Um, there's a subtlety about it that speaks well of Martha Washington and what her choices were, because she obviously had the money to buy anything she wanted. She could have chosen very ornate lace. She could have chosen to wear what was called an engageant, that drippy kind of lace that you see coming from the elbow. That's not what she did. What she chose was lace that was beautifully made, that was very elegant in design, but it was subtle, and there was a modesty about it that I think speaks to the fact that she knew who she was, she certainly wore lace to make sure you, you knew who she was, but she didn't beat you over the head with it. She was modest about it. And um, that aspect of her endeared her to me because she could have done anything. And a year, in the next century, when there was a lot of nouveau riche, there were a lot of etiquette books that addressed what you should wear and how you should wear it. And much to my delight and surprise, there's a great deal written about how much lace you should wear and when you should wear it. The idea is, is that when you entertain, you should dress in a nice manner to show respect for your guest, but you shouldn't take it so over the top to make your guest uncomfortable. It's, it was advice, it sounds silly today, but you don't wear your diamonds to afternoon tea. You might wear your pearls, you don't wear your diamonds, that's for another time. And what I saw in Martha Washington, who could get a guest at any time. She never knew who was going to show up. Um, 
you know, she was entertaining, you know, aristocrats. She was, you know, dealing with other Americans um, who had varying degrees of importance. But she was always dressed like a lady. But it was done very quietly. Beverly, describe the lace that Martha Washington wore on her wedding day. I think that the lace that Martha wore for her wedding was very much a statement about her, particularly at this time in her life. Um, it is very beautiful Mechlin lace. The design is what royalty in Europe would have worn. Um, but she toned it down a little bit. Um, in Europe, in, in the French court, which was very much setting the pace in fashion, women wore layers and layers and layers of lace to show off how much money they had. That's not what she did. She wore a very simple cuff, beautifully done lace, um, of the very finest that Mechlin Flemish lace could offer. But she didn't overdo it. Um, I think that was very much her American sensibility. She was communicating that she was a woman of wealth, of social standing, but she had no need to show off. Um, she this was, and I think that theme of understanding who she is, but not trying to beat you up over it, um, of trying to make the people who she was with feel comfortable, was a theme that I saw all the way through the collection. I don't know what else you want me to say about the lace itself. I've already talked about that it was Mechlin, yeah. that it was... Perfect. Okay. Yep. Um, so the next question is, uh, talk a little bit about the modern day dollar amount. Can we ascribe oh, the dollar amount? Oh, yes. Amount? Okay. You need to keep in mind that lace was the equivalent of jewelry. And they had not yet learned how to cut and polish diamonds. They did have gold, they did have pearls, um, you could use fur, but um, really, if you wanted to show your wealth and social standing, you wore lace. And the wealthier you were, the more lace you wore, and the fancier lace you wore, and you could wear it in a lot of different ways. But to give you an example, um, there is a portrait of one of uh, the French princesses, and I want to tell you it was a daughter of Louis the Fifteenth. And in it, she's wearing seven bands of lace going down her arm. And one of those very simple two-inch bands was worth about two thousand dollars or more in today's money. So by the time you figure that she's wearing 14 of these bands just on a sleeve, and then you have the lace that's going from her shoulder down to her waist, down to her skirt, and her underskirt has lace on, you know, going around the bottom as a flounce, she's working, wearing thousands and thousands of dollars worth of lace. So um, one outfit could be worth thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in lace of you were trying to do something comparable in gemstones today.